Hey, how's it going? Let me know if you can hear me okay in terms of the volume level. I believe there's a fan in the back somewhere, so uh, I'm not sure if there's any noise. You're welcome. Hopefully everything worked out okay for you in terms of the uh, exercises. Very cool. This will probably be about maybe 40 minutes, potentially a little bit longer. I just wanted to kind of go over a watercolor pass on this piece here. Uh, this is something I just drew out in ink first. Uh, this is another commission of a water um, watercolor piece that I have to do of the Monkey King. So I figured I'd show this one live as people were, I'm sure were curious about my watercolor techniques. But the drawing was just kind of done straight in with the uh, brush pen with ink. And then from there I'm just kind of going in there. Appreciate that, man. And in, fa in fact, I might just kind of zoom in on this a little bit closer, excuse the shakiness, just so we have a better view up close first. And I'll kind of pull it back out when I do more details. So I'm just doing really light washes right now. Uh, I just tend to go into certain, certain areas of focal point that I want to focus on, especially in the face and the head. Um, for this series that I've been doing for the commissions, I've been going in watercolor, but uh, very kind of low saturated, uh, a little bit more pastel colors, a lot more water initially, just to kind of do a lot more layering on top. With watercolor, because it's transparent, uh, it's easy to kind of build up saturations as you go. Uh, so all you have to do is kind of go in really light and just mix a lot of water into your paints essentially and to get my darks I mean I do have a black over here uh, this is like a burnt umber on this side here so all I'm doing essentially is kind of um, building up to my darks and, I, and my saturations as I go so I, I mix in my burnt umber and my black a little bit together to get kind of a darker shade. Sometimes I'll add a cool or a warm. Uh, for certain pieces that have lighting in it, I'll tend to kind of go a wash of warm or a wash of cool. And then I go into my local colors. But with this, these pieces here, I've just been kind of going into the local, meaning the color of the actual uh, pieces and the parts, whether it's the fur or the clothing or the skin, uh, as they would be. And not really thinking about too much on tones of color. I mean, I could do that if I want to, but for this one, I like to keep it simple and just kind of light. So I'm just doing the face and the arms and the feet as being a darker value first, and I'll go into the fur next. And this is just a water brush that I'm using right now. Down here to the other hand. And again, it's just a wash of color first. There's a foot in the back over here. The inspiration for this uh, type of primate for my Monkey King was the Hanuman monkey. And I know obviously Hanuman was the uh, Indian version of the Monkey King, and Sun Wukong is the Chinese version of it. But I used the Hanuman monkey. I just like the aesthetic of that uh, primate, the colors and the shapes and the values and all that stuff. So I used that monkey as a reference point. For the fur, it's going to be a little bit more of a warmer tone. Uh, the burnt umber is a warmer tone anyway, so I'm probably going to use a bit of yellow ochre and a bit of the dark to get into the actual hair. And I want that face to be high contrast, so I'll go into the fur next. So going down into the palette over here, I'm going to mix a bit of this yellow ochre, some of the burnt umber to get a darker value. But this is again a more warmer shade, warmer tone. Now I'm just going lightly, kind of dabbing over here on the side. I have a towel over here on the right hand side. And then I just go into the shadow ends, and I kind of kick up a little bit of that fur detail. It's going to be much more lighter. I don't know if it'll even show up on the camera, honestly. So I don't know what the quality is like, depending on YouTube. Your probably your your um, internet connection, I'm sure, makes it seem. I'm not sure what the quality is, but it should be at 720.
I believe these um, live sessions are saved on YouTube. I'm just recording it off my phone, so that way you can have uh, viewing access to it later on. It should maintain a higher quality from that viewing instead of being live, because with live it drops in and out with the internet connection. Um, so again, apologies if you are not able to see very clearly as what's going on. I pretty much have dabbled in every way possible for live sessions except for Twitch and I think that's my last kind of uh, venture into going into live sessions because I've tried the Instagram approach I've tried the Facebook approach and you know they've been okay uh, I've been wanting to use YouTube for a while now the YouTube channel you know obviously is a good place to put out these videos uh, and the live session I'm glad it's actually available now for the um, the phone mobile but again I'm not sure about the quality this is just a watercolor paper. Uh, this particular brand that I'm using is this one here. It's called Canal Paper. And this one I bought while I was in Australia, in Sydney. It was an art store out there, and I found it. I've never seen this paper actually in the US, honestly. So if you want to find it, you'll probably have to go online. But it's a very nice watercolor paper. It's very absorbent, uh, spreads the watercolor uh, really nicely soaks it up and gives you nice really good gradients so mixing in a lot of water here the summer was uh, good I uh, did a lot of things that I needed to do in, in terms of not really taking a break so normally I would be teaching three terms in a year uh, for the many schools that I teach at and this summer term was my very first term off in seven years of teaching And so I needed to take a term off to actually do more work So it was a lot of traveling, you know doing some uh, comic-con stuff personal projects here and there uh, And it was a good kind of you know moment to catch up on a few things that I needed to But I uh, definitely miss the scheduling of work being back in a classroom uh, The scheduling actually helped me work better on my own stuff in a lot of ways because when I took a term off I imagine oh, I have all this time now but having all that time off, you know, it, it actually made it a little bit difficult to maintain a schedule because it just felt like you just have more time. But on a, on a working schedule, because you're doing so much other stuff, it makes you really focus on what you need to do per day. So in actuality, I know how some people feel like, oh, I need more time off to do my own thing. But I actually found it to be the different result where it's like the busier I was, the better I was at maintaining a schedule. And so when I had all the time in the world, I actually got a lot lazier <laughs> too. So I'm actually watching this feed on my own uh, Surface Pro 4 on my YouTube channel, just seeing the actual quality level and so I can read your questions also. Uh, but it seems to be a little bit blurry. I'm not sure if that's the phone or on oh, my phone it looks kind of clear. But Anyways, we'll keep going. Yellow ochre, burnt umber, mixing it together right here. Mixing a little bit more yellow ochre to get a bit more of that warmness in there, dabbing it on my towel, and then just kind of in hitting in the shadow areas. I want a lot of that paper to show through. This paint, as I'm putting it down, is still very wet, so it kind of bleeds into it really nicely and makes it softer. Pieces like this will take me, you know, up to an hour and a half <clears throat> to finish. The drawing itself took me an hour, maybe. So usually I can finish these commissions in, you know, a couple of hours. When I'm doing them at the convention, I tend to try to elongate them through the show so people can kind of see what I'm doing. Uh, when I'm doing them at home, I tend to push through a little bit quicker. This series of uh, Monkey Kings that I've been doing were my versions of the Monkey King in my story for the comic that I'm going to be putting out by the end of the year. And in this version, the Monkey King has now become a drunk. <laughs> he's actually, uh, it's been centuries past his journey to the West, and now he's uh, settled and retired and he's become a peach, peach liquor drinker. He's a drunk. So all he does all day is just hang about and drink. until my character, the blacksmith, finds him 
and uh, requires his assistance to get back his magical staff, which he had planted into the ground and enlarged it as a monument to himself and his achievements. And since he doesn't fight anymore, he didn't need it. But without knowing, there was an entire village after years and years that it formed and created a civilization around his staff. The staff he grew into a large, large um, monument, the size of a mountain. So some of the hair portions right there are pretty good. Again, because of the light, you probably can't see the warmness. It's very different than what I'm seeing. But uh, let's keep moving forward. I'm gonna go into some of the um, let's go into the, some of the jewelry up there. His crown that he still wears as a reminder. Sticking to the warms, go into the jewelry a little bit down here. Try a little bit of olives into this as too. There, some of the cooler tones. Now I tend to do these kind of local colors at first. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hit the shadows just yet. I'll do it afterwards after I do a whole pass. Now his scarf or his uh, cloak is more of a greenish olive tone, which I'll mix here with this kind of. Um, it's like a permanent green with a um, little bit of the yellow ochre and the burnt umber. And for these particular pieces, again, I'm trying to keep them light in terms of saturation, Not, nothing too heavy or contrasty. Uh, I wanted to feel very kind of um, almost um I mean pastelish is one of the words I use but also just kind of airy open And if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer as best I can. We'll go into some of the jewelry on his arm a little bit here. Still sticking to the warms for that burnt sienna in there, giving it more of a copper tone. Maybe a little bit more on the main piece. Visual storytelling in my work, uh, a lot of that is based upon, you know, in terms of visual stories, of, of course, knowing the characters, knowing their background, what they're doing. Um, you know, a lot of it comes just to kind of brainstorming 
about your own work. Uh, if you're de you know developing a character, you got to think about their personality. Uh, you got to almost put yourself in their position. You got to almost act it out in your head. Kind of like how animators will watch themselves in mirrors and, and act out certain scenes so that in their scene work in the pieces, they can actually capture the kind of emotion or personality they want to go for. So even in a piece that you're creating as an illustration or, or even a design, you know, the kind of like the words we would use, the keywords, and how we would explain uh, visual storytelling to a verbal word. So connecting verbal words can be actually very helpful as well. Uh, and I think writing before you actually even just start creating anything is always a good step to take. And I'm not saying you have to write like a novel, but even just kind of simply stating out certain kind of verbal words or uh, things that you, you think would describe that scene really well could be helpful. Well, uh, Nikesh, in terms of mixing, a lot of that is from, you know, traditionally painting a lot back when I was in school. So we'd be, you know, trained to use things like watercolors or acrylics and definitely oils and uh, understanding, you know, colors and how they work in terms of what mixes you would need to have uh, from painting is where we would get a lot of the information from. Um, you know, even as you've noticed, I don't really wipe down or clean my brush a lot. I just tend to go back into the palette and, um, you know, having certain colors all mixed, not mixed together, but definitely touched upon can make it feel more unified. Uh, by doing an undertone can also help you a lot there too. But for mixing, a lot of that is definitely practiced as well. But just understanding, understanding general color theory is helpful. A uh, question from Trevor was, do you warm up before you get going on your work or do you tend to just dive in on uh, some of the pieces? Uh, well, of course, back in the day, I think warming up is extremely important. Uh, for me now, I don't warm up. I just tend to just, you know, do it. <laughs> Sit there and I know what I need to actually accomplish. I need to know what, what I have to do. So it requires less, you know, prep work or thinking or even warm ups to really get comfortable and settled into what I'm going to do. And um, so... That takes time and mileage, obviously, to get there. But as a student, I would highly recommend warming up in any piece. So if, even if you're painting or drawing, mm -hmm. doing small little sessions or, or warm-ups, I think, could be extremely helpful. Color is not easy. It's one of those things where I get easily lost in on as well. I, I had a very difficult time with color when I was in school. I still have a very difficult time because I'm not necessarily a person that thinks through color and light. I am I'm a draftsman. You know, I think through line and shape. So color to me can always be somewhat of a, of a mystery at times too, especially when it comes to full rendered painting. Now this is a little bit different. Watercolor to me was more attractive because it was still based on the fact that it was a drawing. And I'm having watercolor as being a transparent medium as being the under uh, painting. So watercolor always came more natural to me because it felt like drawing than painting. Uh, so that's why I would recommend that watercolor instead of like full painting for those of you that feel like you're more of a draftsman. But I think you should still dabble into actual painting um, because I did as well and I think it, even though it's something I don't necessarily push heavily, uh, it's something that I appreciate the information that I do have of. And I think going the traditional route, as you're saying, before you go digital can be a good path because that's pretty much what all, you know, uh, modern artists before digital really came along heavily came about, did start off with. You know, we all did traditional first. Now, I'm not saying because, you know, everyone did that, you have to follow the same rules either. But I think you should dabble in both. All right, uh, let's go into his tail. What I'm using right now is just a water brush. So all I need to do is squeeze the handle and the water kind of cleanses some of the paint away so it doesn't become as heavy. And I can just use the washes to get really light and gradient in some of the parts. And it depends upon your intention of what you're trying to do. Uh, if you are painting, then obviously you, can, you shouldn't paint like you draw. It doesn't work that way. Um, but, again, it depends on the actual project, depends on the piece, depends on what your intentions are. So it's more important based on your thought process and how it works to what you want to accomplish and what you're trying to go for. If you're trying to go for a painting, then yeah, line depend depending on the line is not really going to help you. You want to obviously have a nice structured drawing for proportion and shape um, and for the piece, but the painting will then rely on your value, your composition, your color, uh, lighting. But for drawing, then obviously everything is line. So it, it's all based upon what you're working on, really.
and I don't think you know having a prejudice to one or the other is really important. You just have to experiment with all of it and find out what works best for you. Because no matter what I'm even talking about now, doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work for you. Uh, it works for me, but you'll have your own process eventually. And through trial and error, you can then formulate your own opinion. So um, take it, you know, take people's opinions and advices obviously with seriousness, but in the end, you're the one who has to really figure out how to actually fit within the way you wanna create the pieces you want to. It's, it's the whole process of what I talk about in my classes too, was that where you start to understand the rules and then you break them, right? Follow, you know, follow certain paths and advices and from there question them because through that, that's what this whole thing is about. I mean, you want to understand the games and, and the rules and how everyone works, but again, that's what sets you apart from anybody else is that you see things differently. You're going to want to express things differently. And through that it what's, is what creates uniqueness and independence and uh, not as just a replication of the same thing over and over again. Well, the YouTube channel isn't necessarily a big thing uh, for me. I, I only just started it, and I don't really post that much on here. So I know I link my Instagram, and everyone I tell them I'm I'm here doing this kind of thing. But you know, people can be lazy. <clears throat> and I just do this for the fact that I'm working on this stuff anyways, and I'm doing it more for fun. So if nobody was here, I would still be doing this anyways. Doesn't really matter. I'm going to go into the bottom cloth, which is more of like a tiger pelt. We'll go into the warmer tones again, a little bit more saturated. Appreciate that, Kat. Thank you again for the support. Studio Maxwell asks, do you have a favorite medium or is it just whatever you have on hand at the time? Uh, for me, uh, it's all based upon what the intention again of the piece is for. Uh, if I just want to sketch on location, I tend to go for very simple pens, felt tip pens or fountain pens. If I'm doing commission pieces, I prefer watercolor because of the quickness but also because I feel more natural about it. If I'm doing client work, uh, studio work, I do digital most of the times. Uh, if it's personal projects, based upon the project itself. Again, the blacksmith comic I'm doing is mainly just, mainly just ink. Uh, so a lot of it is determined upon what I'm doing it for. Nikesh asked, Do, did I learn human anatomy? Uh, I find that most, if not all, the artists I follow say so. Of course, absolutely. Um, whether you're going through t traditional schools and you know, programs and stuff like that, or you're doing it by yourself, uh, obviously you still want to know the fundamentals of things and the fundamentals based upon uh, what we create for concept design or, or art or expression, whatever the case is, you have to know the fundamentals of everything uh, as best as possible, obviously. And the main place we like to start it is human anatomy. And human anatomy is very difficult to fully understand or even memorize, which, you know, again, can be a lifetime thing. But having a very basic fundamental understanding of how human anatomy works, muscle groupings can help you understand many other animals afterwards, too because that can be used as an archetype or principle to then transfer the information over to other elements and areas that you want to help create. So yes, you should learn human anatomy. This primate, for instance, gorillas or, or chimpanzees or monkeys, I mean, anatomy-wise, they're essentially the same thing we are, but you just change proportions of things of length, size, weight, then all of a sudden you have a very different kind of animal. You include animals of like big cats. Big cats have, you know, can have very similar structurings um, and they're obviously shared within each other. And you just have to understand pull parts and pieces of things, you pull them apart and if you start to understand how to mix them properly, you have functional knowledge as well too. How certain muscles work, what's a pull and what's a push muscle. Uh, what are twitch muscles? What are, you know, certain muscles for speed? What are certain muscles for strength? Um, you know, those kinds of things, information wise. So it makes your designs that much more believable. 
Joshua asked, do you always start with line and then color or colors and then line too? Actually, you know, Joshua, that is more determined upon what you prefer. Uh, this one, a lot of my commissions, I start with line first because I am more dependent on the drawing and then I go into the color. But there is no reason why you can't do a painting of a watercolor first and then put the line on top. It probably could be a bit more abstract in that way, uh, but that's definitely not a thing that's incorrect. Uh, there is no right or wrong, really. You know, it's more about what makes sense to you, what feels more natural. And for me, I prefer going line first. Again, I'm not saying that th that way is the correct way. I'm saying that's what works for me. So I'm going to go into a, a few dark areas and start punching things in a little bit more. I want to pull back on him just slightly. Sorry for the shakiness. <clears throat> the cloud's going to be more of a cooler color, blues and violets, and a little bit of pinks here and there too. I'm going to fill in a few more spots. I'm going to start to kick up the contrast a bit more. Let's even go into the um, gourds, the uh, wine holders. Kat asked the question, is there any techniques you struggle most with or type of drawing, like portraits of charcoal? Um, no, I, per I, I enjoy a lot of mediums. Um, in terms of techniques, not necessarily so. But in terms of subject matter, I like drawing everything. But the ones I struggled with the most when I was younger were environments, um, landscapes and stuff like that. I had a hard time with because of the way I think. I tend to think with a lot of detail and logic. So having information of like landscapes were so daunting because there was so much information. It was kind of hard to balance stuff. And I ended up doing, tend to, tend to uh, doing more detail than I needed to and uh, killing the piece. So I found those to be difficult at first. But now it's a little bit easier because I know how to balance things out better. Uh, Studio Max will ask, did you do the line drawing with the Pentel color brush pen? If so, did you replace the ink with waterproof ink like the platinum carbon ink? I did not. Um, I used the Pentel color brush pen with the ink that is already in there. Next question is, uh, I see Kim, uh, K, Kim, I'm assuming you're talking about Kim Jong-il painting with watercolors and is mesmerizing. Absolutely. Man's a genius. What top type of watercolors do I prefer? I would I tend to use a lot of uh, Windsor Newton, but this brand here is called uh, I don't know if you can't see that, but it's called Schmincke S C H M I N C K E Schmincke. It was a gift, so. But it has a nice vibrant coloring. And the choices of color come out very nicely. So I'm going to do a couple more smaller areas. I'm going to go into the cloud next. Like the rope here. Yes, it is uh, quite spendy from what I understand. But you just buy one travel case and this will probably last you a good lifetime. You just have to buy a couple of um, tubes and good to go. Again, think of it as an investment. And, and the uh, brushes that I'm using is just a Pentel water brush pen. I have two here. Uh, they're essentially the, both the same, uh, but I just kept two because if wa uh, one runs out of water, then I have another, another one to go to. Kudataki brand of watercolor I have never really used, but I'm assuming they'd be okay. All right, I'm going to go into the cloud next, and I'm going to use this one. Uh, this one is actually a little bit uh, different than the one on the right. This one I actually not customized in any way, but I did break it down and, and broke it apart. Uh, with these water brushes, you can actually break it down completely. And the inside of these little funnels, uh, there is a little nozzle 
that kind of restricts or even filters some of the water through and that had distorted through age and just use and I took it out and got rid of it. So that means there's a lot more flow of water out of this particular brush pen than the other one. So I'll show you real quickly. If I squeeze this one, water eventually comes out. With the same amount of pressure, water drips out like crazy on this one. So this one has a less of a filter in it, so it actually has a more flow of, of water in this one. A little bit harder to use. I don't necessarily collect them, I just end up having a lot of them because I draw a lot with uh, fountain pens. Current favorite brands are Pilot, the Pilot brand. I do like Lamy's. Let's go into some of the blues here. I'm gonna douse it with water a little bit more. I'm gonna mix it with a bit of the purples as well too. And a little bit of the pinks. The Pilot brand is quite nice, but definitely on the more spendier side. If you're looking for more of a cost-effective fountain pen, I would always recommend the Hero fountain pens, which you can easily find on eBay. Uh, they're just t uh, branded H-E-R-O, Hero fountain pens. They're manufactured in China and you know not the highest quality in terms of pen manufacturing, but they're cheap, very cheap, and they actually are very functional um, in terms of use. So I would always recommend those. And if you go through my YouTube channel, there are a couple of reviews that I had done. Uh, one based on one of the Hero pens. Which might be a little bit hard to find now. I'm going to get a little bit more paint over here on this one. A lot of water just on there right now. And I just kind of move it around. When it comes to watercolor, essentially you don't want to fight it. You just have to let it do what it does, which is bleed and move around and soak and mix and the more you try to control it or make it try to do something it maybe can't do uh, or what you're expecting, then it comes out very disappointing. Thankfully with the uh, drier heat here in California, the paints tend to dry pretty quickly. For those of you that are here and joining now, you're again welcome to ask any questions you like uh, based upon process or thinking or what I'm working on, what it's for. Um, that's why I'm here. The um, repeatographs I've used since I've been in high school, I still have a collection of repeatographs I've had since I was in high school. And um, I only use those for inking though. 
So if I'm inking something uh, from a pencil sketch or a pencil drawing into a very, very clean pen illustration, I would use those rotor ring repeatographs. I don't use them to sketch with. I don't use them to draw with initially. It's mainly an inking tool for me. They're very technical, very, very sensitive pens, which is why they're not very good for um, freehand sketching. One of my favorite exercises to do improving dynamic sketching is definitely a lot of the elliptical exercises, doing ellipses, circles, practicing that just endlessly where you know, maybe I'm watching a movie or, or talking to somebody else, exercising a couple of the things. Um, doing ellipses is a very easy one to do. You can just kind of sit there and mindlessly kind of do them. Because again, a lot of that is based upon your muscle memory improvement. So um, definitely that one I wouldn't push the most. Just kind of filling up a few spots here and there and I'm going to go into the face again. So pretty much everything has been filled in with a wash. And I'm never gonna, now I'm going to go into the face and uh, we're going to zoom in again real quickly. Or not zoom in, but just kind of set the camera in closer so I can go back in and push a little bit harder. So excuse the shakiness of the camera, my phone that is. It's on a bendable arm, so it's a little bit... Uh, hard to control at times. Trying to focus it. I don't know if it does autofocus or not, but it seems a little bit blurry on the phone too. Well, hopefully that will automatically focus at some point. <clears throat> Um, okay, let's go back into the head now. And I'm going to start to mix up a bit more paint. Uh, I'm going to come in there and just kind of bring in a bit more burnt umber, a little bit more black. I'm going to go a little bit heavier in terms of the thickness of the paint. Keeping it still warm to the face. Uh, so that way when I start to really push in, contrast will really pop out. And as I kind of put in these areas, I'll start to blend them out with the other brush pen. Uh, hold on. The connection seems to be really bad for some reason, but let me pull it out just a bit more so it focuses a bit better. Let me answer your question, uh, Nikesh. A lot of artists say to observe, but what does that mean? Um, they say observe and then draw the object without looking at it. Does that help to understand the object better than copying? Uh, I have a lot of you know thoughts and opinions about that particular side of it. I will just start with the word of observing first. Um, and when it comes to my classes in dynamic sketching, some of you obviously sh may know of it. Um, it requires you to observe, right? We are going on location, we are looking at the actual things, and we're drawing from observation. So what is the point of that? Why not just look at a photograph and just kind of use that information that's available there to you? Um, and I'm sure a lot of you guys already understand why we do observational drawing, and I don't really need to uh, give you a whole spiel on it, but let me just kind of give you my thoughts. The reason why I find observational drawing very important is not because of just seeing the thing three-dimensionally. Okay. Of course, that is one factor. So the fact that you can see it three-dimensionally, you can turn it in space, you can view from different angles, you can get in close and far away, uh, you have a lot more information in front of you than you would in a photograph, because the photograph is a two-dimensional image. So what are the other benefiting factors? Um, for me, it has to do with the experience. 
of being on location. So if I'm on location drawing from observation, it's not just something that I'm observing, but it's stuff that I'm experiencing also. So I experience the sights, the people, the sounds, the smells, the interactions. Those add to my experience of what I'm going through and help through my memory to retain that information with what I'm drawing. So I still have drawings from the days when I was in school that I remember where I was, what the weather was like, you know, what the sounds were, uh, the feeling that I had of the drawing because of the fact that I was there in front of it and I had experiences behind it. So that's one of the main aspects of observation and drawing that I find to be extremely important. Is there anything wrong with copying? No, absolutely not. Copy it so that you understand what you have visually. The problem with copying that can happen though is that when you're copying something over is that you tend to not really study it. Okay, you take things for granted and you look at it and you just copy the visuals, but you don't really learn anything from it. You don't really retain any memory from it. So that requires you to look at the reference again, where you find more references. So you don't really build your visual vocabulary by copying something. It helps for technique, but it doesn't help for your visual vocabulary. And that's a really important part of observation. <clears throat> to mix the question from uh, Studio Maxwell, how often do you use reference while doing these kinds of drawings for your commissions, like the Joker one you just did, or have you just developed your visual library enough to skip it? Uh, t in most cases, I've been able to develop it enough to skip it. The observation helps immensely, uh, where I can study the things from real life or from fictional things, and I've drawn things many, many times over again where my visual library is deep enough. So the Joker, I mean, that's easy. I can draw him over and over again without any reference at all. I can create my own version of the Joker if I wanted to. Um, and that's the thing, it's like I have now ways to play with stuff because I understand how things are visually. So even this primate, the Hanuman monkey, is the only thing I use reference for. I looked at you know, a couple images of just what they look like for color and value, and that was it. Uh, from there, I can change the posing, I can change the angle, I can push the proportions, I can make it into a character any way I want to without having to really rely on the reference. I just needed it as a point of inspiration. That was it. So um, that's the way I use reference. Is that It's not reference for copying, it's not reference for uh, visual information, but it's just inspiration. Okay. So continuing you know, with, with Nikesh's question about observation and why, you know, what it's for and why it's important, uh, again, a lot of it is just kind of mixing the question for studio is the fact that it helps us build a deep visual vocabulary of information that we can use to help create to design. Um, and I think that's why it's extremely important. So what can you do when you don't have access to specific subject matter in things um, like military weapons or vehicles or things that don't exist? Well, that's why you do have to use reference, right? So I'm not saying that you have to negate or cancel out the use of referencing, because I still do. Uh, but I'm saying there are things that you can look at that can almost be parallels to those things. So what can you look at if you don't have access to military vehicles? Well, I'm sure you might be able to find a few uh, construction vehicles here and there, possibly. Bulldozers, cranes. Um, and maybe you can observe those every now and again. That's the thing. It's like if you if you come across some of those things, can you take your own references and photographs of those that stuff? You know, um, can you go to like a, a, a car show? Will they have trucks? You know, things that are a bit more kind of rugged. Now they're not actually military vehicles, so that's where it would require you to actually look at the references of specific things. But still, having seen something that can be parallel to something can give you a frame of reference, give you a context as to scale, size, uh, textural information, the kind of materials. Um, you know, I think that kind of stuff can help immensely also. For instance, you know, you might not be able to observe a certain insect from a different, you know, part of the world. But knowing certain insects that live within your own area, maybe you can go to a natural history museum. Maybe you can actually find some information that's similar to it. There are archetypes in everything that we draw. I talk about this a lot in my class. The, the, the use of archetypes is really important because everything that we draw from different subject matters, from insects to fish to vehicles to weapons, uh, guns or armor sets, there is an archetype for that specific subject, right? So fish share archetypes, much like us people share archetypes. We have an archetype in, in our human proportion and form. Everybody has two arms, everybody has two legs, they're born with those things. Um, and again, the, it changes proportionally from person to person, but we're all born the same, essentially, um, generally, right? Those are the archetypes. So insects also have six legs, three body parts. Fish all have, you know, six or seven fish fins. And, and, you know, we have a lot of things that are sharing from one another. But then once you adjust proportioning, then you start to get someone very individual. Um, but that's why if you don't have access to the specific thing, you still want to look for the more general. 
CO2 Delirious asks, uh, what was your art style in high school? What was your artwork mainly in ink, watercolor, acrylic? Uh, for me, it was a lot of pencil, ballpoint, and watercolor. I played a little bit with markers here and there. I did get into digital a little bit too, but in high school, I copied a lot as well. My favorite artists back in high school were a lot of comic book artists. I you know, copied guys like Jim Lee, copied guys like Joe Madrera, uh, Frank Miller, you know, Jeff Darrow, and, and I copied them to a T. Even Japanese manga artists, you know, guys like Akira Toriyama and Katsuhiro Otomo, all those guys were big influences when I was a teenager, and uh, I copied them all the time. And that's because, one, I didn't have a style, right? I just liked to draw. And I liked their style a lot, so I wanted to imitate them because being a younger mind, I want to reflect off of what's being created. Gives me a sense of, of uh, quality, gives me a sense of what they were doing. I didn't really understand what I was doing at the time, but everybody kind of naturally does that, right? Certain artists that you like, you want to copy it. Um, and then from there, you start to build a sense of your own tastes. And that's really the thing that I was doing, and that what you should be doing is through observation and through copying of real things, fictional things, and of other artists, is what you were doing is that you were building your sense of taste, of quality, of aesthetic, of um, you know, certain things that you like in storytelling possibly too. So through that, you can then start to formulate your own opinions, having some kind of you know, basis of context there, which then you can build from. So there is no originality, there is no sense of you know, freshness, uh, that's completely your own. Everything is built on something else. And that's okay, because that's the way it's always been. But for the people that tend to get stuck are the ones that end up feeling on that, because that can be a problem with copying. Copying can be great because it gives you a sense of context. But the problem is, there are people out there that get stuck in copying, and they don't know how to break away from it. They don't know how to push it. They don't, how to, they don't know how to take the aspects of what makes it successful and make it their own. So that can be one of the downsides of only copying and not having actual anal you know, analysis as to why and what you liked about it. So when you are creating things, you got to question all the time. Why do you like it? Why are you copying it? What is it about that piece you like about it? You know? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. And again, video game references are awesome. You know, it's great now because the games we produce these days are so amazing looking. And the fact that they have things like, you know, camera views where you can just pause the game and move the camera around. Uh, you can get some really amazing environment shots, action shots, and draw from those if you want to. But you know, even for when it comes back to the idea of copying and looking at artists, even back when I was in high school, even to this day, I can still draw like Akira Toriyama. I can draw like Masumune Shiro because I copy their stuff so much. I know exactly how they approach their shapes. I know exactly their aesthetics. So I can actually imitate their stuff to a T right, right now for you if I wanted to. I could draw Goku <laughs> really easily uh, because I know what they look like. And that's the constant repetition. That's where you build your visual vocabulary again. From there, if you start to move into real things, from nature, from engineering, you have that same sense of drive and interest and curiosity. Then you start to me meld things together from like style, then to also function, to real things. And if, when you're developing your own ideas and designs, then you have a huge, huge well of information to pull from. Not just style, but then real function. Diversity is key, okay? So you want to practice from every angle. <clears throat> it's very easy to get comfortable in one sort or one way. And the idea is to recognize when you're too comfortable to continue to challenge yourself to move into another direction. We're getting there, we're getting there. A couple more things in the cloth. With watercolor, once you put on the paint, it actually comes out a lot darker than you may have intended, but as it dries, it lightens up a lot. So that's the one thing you have to kind of predict. That's what makes watercolor painting very difficult. Also gouache painting is that when you apply the paint onto the paper, it comes off very, very dark in value. So you think you got it wrong, uh, but then you have to kind of wait to let it settle in a little bit and then it starts to lighten up dramatically. Gouache can be very difficult for that because gouache is not transparent, it's more of an opaque paint. So it actually can be a little bit more difficult to work with. 
uh, and I found it to be very challenging to paint with gouache back in the day. All right, I'm gonna pull back the uh, phone again just a bit more, bear with the shakiness. more things to do with this one uh, I'm not sure how long I've been going but we'll start to finish up here soon if anybody has any last comments questions please do ask next time I do a live piece I'm not exactly sure this was just more spontaneous I just wanted to put it on camera um, I'd like to do a bit more if I can uh, this coming month or so has just become so crazy busy that I've been haven't had a chance to really do anything live as much as I used to. So hopefully we'll get back into it in the future. CO2, I, I really don't get that. Um, thankfully, I know some people, I know a lot of friends that have had to deal with that kind of issue and problem. Um, in that situation, I know they like to wear gloves at times. Um, but for me, I don't get that. Uh, I'm very dry. <clears throat> when was it that I became more confident enough to sell my work? Uh, I mean, you know, I've always been selling my work. Even as a kid, uh, I was kind of a little bit like that. You know, when I was younger, I would actually just create sketches and drawings. I'd actually sell them when I was even in like elementary school. Like kids would ask me like, oh, draw this, draw that, and they'll pay me like a dollar, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so I'm very used to uh, commerce and trade and artwork. What keeps me drawing? Uh, the fact that I just enjoy just drawing. Uh, the subject matter can be almost anything, but the very act of drawing is what I enjoy. Uh, I get up and sleep thinking about it. I mean, the year of like, you know, a couple years ago, 2014 and 15, that particular year, I drew nonstop, like every single day for an entire year straight uh, is where I just kept drawing. And I still do, you know, it's one of those things where, I, you know, we have things like October where it's like Inktober and you draw like, you know, an ink piece every single day per month. But you know, that kind of stuff is fun. It's great because it gives you a motivation to create something because of subject matter. But to me, I don't, I literally draw every single day. Because I find whatever I'm creating interesting, story-wise, functionally, realistically or not, I'll always go on location somewhere. Being on location is the best thing to do. Being stuck in your home, being behind the computer, uh, before you know it, hours will go by and you've, know, you've all of a sudden seen that you haven't drawn or done anything. <laughs> so getting out of the house, I find to be extremely important. Drawing at a cafe, I know some people are very self-conscious, like, oh, I don't want people to see what I'm doing. But, you know, you kind of got to have to get over that because in the industry, if you work in it, you're working with people. So people are going to see your work at some point. And you got to get used to having to share your work and talk about it and say what you're thinking and that kind of stuff. And that's fine, too. That doesn't mean that you have to have a career. But the fact is, this is something that is to help you, whether it's a social thing or not. But it should help also boost confidence, too. Uh, you know, the class I teach is all about that. The main focus is about boosting confidence uh, so that you're confident in drawing in front of others, you're confident in drawing anything you can. Um, you know, so a lot of it is based upon the fact that you're just put in the position to do and perform. But of course, at the very end, are you just enjoying it? And if you're having a lot of fun with what you're creating, then it doesn't matter what people see or don't see or say or don't say. Um, you know, I draw things for me. I don't draw things for anybody else. People may ask me, like, oh, can you do a commission of this and that? It's like, sure, but I'm doing this because it's fun for me. I will be doing this anyways, you know? I'm going to do a couple more things in the clouds over here. We'll call it good. I'll probably touch upon a few more things after we close off. Just a few detail spots here and there. But this is pretty much there. In the future, this will be the best place to come see any other live pieces or drawings or Q&As that you guys may have in the future. I'll continue to announce it on usually Instagram or my Facebook, um, so that way you'll know that it's going to happen. But I pretty much will probably end up sticking with YouTube, 
to keep doing live feeds unless I consider doing a Twitch channel, which I've seen a couple of my friends start to do. Um, I tried it once, but it wasn't necessarily ready yet for mobile uh, apps, but now I believe it is. So it was always good for like video game players, but I never, I didn't think it would be ready yet for artists, but it seems like it's getting there. Just a few dark spots here and there under the cloud. Just to separate some of the forms. That's what it seems to be like. So I'll probably research a little bit more on Twitch and see what um, I can do about that. I might even just stick with YouTube because of the fact I'm trying to build this channel, uh, but we'll see. That's the problem with these days. Like You have so many options in terms of social media platforms that once you start in one thing, it's like, oh, there's another one you want to do, and there's another one you got to do, and generating content for that can be you know, time consuming. Um, and when you stick with one, you have to be consistent with it, and that's the most important thing. Without consistency, it's really hard to build any sort of uh, library of content and people just don't get interested in that so when you stick with one you kind of have to stick with it of course absolutely hopefully all you guys enjoyed it uh, we're gonna be closing off here uh, enjoy the rest of your night day or morning whatever the case is for you and uh, hopefully I'll be back at some point online thanks you guys